Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and we are currently working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. We give you thanks and praise for your love. We give you thanks and praise that you have shown us your love by giving us your Son. By giving the world your Son, who then became a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. And so we ask you, Heavenly Father, now to come around all of our, um, our ears, our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and touch us in just the way that each and every one of us needs to be touched personally today. Grow us up in your word. Draw us nearer and nearer to you through your living word, uh, which then is activated, which is activated by your Holy Spirit. And so we thank you for this time together, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday, Jesus did much to prepare his disciples for the welcome they might receive as they go out with the good news of the kingdom of God. They could possibly expect, expect to be arrested, flogged, and brought before governors and kings. Their families might turn against them, and there likely would be division between family members because of him. All of the trouble was due to the fact that since the fall of humankind into sin, spiritual darkness has reigned throughout the earth. Those living in spiritual darkness are not altogether receptive of hearing that they are in darkness and that God has provided a remedy for them to get out of the darkness. Ignoring the fact that the world is in darkness helps no one. And so as Jesus was sent into the world by his Father, so he sent his disciples into the world to continue the work he began. We heard Jesus tell his disciples that they would not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. We considered at length what this particular passage might mean. Comparing the text from Matthew 10 with the passage that is most similar to it in Luke 21, we reached the conclusion that Jesus was most likely not talking about his second coming to the earth in the end of days, but that he was likely speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, which took place a short 40 years after Jesus' ascension into heaven. What Jesus was telling his disciples is that they needed to spread the good news of the kingdom of God with urgency. Returning to the warnings Jesus was giving to his disciples, Jesus said, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house is called, or has been called, Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Jesus was mistreated and eventually crucified. We need to understand that we will likely be mistreated as, as well and not be surprised by it. Martin Luther remarked that the gospel cannot be preached without offense. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. But the rulers, powers, and principalities of darkness will try to silence us in any way they can by using the people who are currently aligned with the devil. Unfortunately, a large number of these people consider themselves to be good Christians, Christians who nevertheless are doing the devil's bidding rather than doing the work and will of the Lord. Even though we can expect to be treated badly, we are told that we are not to be afraid of those who come against us. What can any of these people do? Even if they kill our bodies, they cannot kill our souls. The one we need to fear, the one we need to revere and respect is the Lord. The people who come against us in any way, they will have to answer to God, as will we. Let's keep our focus on the Lord. He who sends us out is the one who will guard us and keep us. To further encourage his disciples and us, Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. In times of trouble, it may be tempting to keep our mouths shut. To keep us from going too far down this line of thinking, Jesus said, Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. We also heard yesterday that Jesus did not come to bring peace to the earth, but a sword. The peace Jesus did bring was his accomplished work that he then reconciled us with the Heavenly Father. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. However, the trouble or the sword Jesus speaks about is the trouble that, he is, that his coming into the earth brings between people, even between close family members. Every single person on earth must decide who Jesus is. Is Jesus who he says he is, the Son of God and the Savior of the world, or is he an imposter, someone to be dismissed because he thought too highly of himself? Every person gets to decide. No one can avoid siding with Jesus or against him. As I said yesterday, there are no free zones. There is no such thing as permanently straddling the fence. Either we are for Jesus or against him. The world began drawing up sides already in Jesus' day. Maybe you've already noticed that the distinction between the followers of Jesus and those who do not follow him is growing more and more distinct with each passing day and month and year. We can expect this to continue as the day of Jesus' return gets closer and closer to us. Still, Jesus' reminder that we are not to be afraid of people is for us to remember at all times. And just so that we know it, we do not need to fear the devil or all the demons of hell. The devil is a defeated foe. And if we throw our lot in with Jesus and believe in him, then we need not fear the devil. In fact, our job as believers in Christ is, that, is to be that of an enforcer. We enforce the victory Jesus won for us on the cross and through the grave. We enforce Jesus' victory when we operate in and with the authority Jesus has given us. When we heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, make the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak in the authority of Jesus, we are enforcing the victory Jesus has already won. Jesus came to free those held by the captives. So do we. That's what we are to do. Now the last passage we talked about yesterday was Matthew 10, uh, 40 where Jesus said, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. I want to repeat what I said yesterday, because it is so very important for us to understand what Jesus says here. There are, unfortunately, many people today who do not understand this truth. The people who are sent out to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God represent Jesus. To, rep to receive Jesus' as representative is to receive Jesus, and to receive Jesus is to receive the Heavenly Father who sent him. This is serious, because the opposite is also true. If Jesus' representatives are not received when Jesus is not received, well then Jesus is not received either. And if Jesus is not received, then the Heavenly Father is not received. There are many Christian congregations who need to learn this truth. Far too many pastors have learned to their sorrow that the congregations they serve see them not as servants sent by Jesus and by his Father into their midst, but as hirelings who are expected to kowtow to the so-called leaders in the congregation. To what purpose did Jesus send out his disciples? That purpose has not changed. Congregations who have moved away from God's purposes need to return to his way. If they don't, then they may one day realize that Jesus has removed the lampstand he had once placed in their midst. Obviously, that would not be good for any congregation to have that happen. It will be good for the people who receive those whom Jesus sends to them. Jesus said, anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. 
and anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Matthew 11. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now we might be thinking, Come on, John, you of all people should know that Jesus was the one who was to come. I mean, hadn't John been told of his own miraculous birth and the prophetic words spoken about him, that he would prepare the way of the Lord? Hadn't he been told by his mother of the moment he leaped in her womb at the sound of Mary's voice when she came to visit her in her sixth month of pregnancy? Hadn't John seen the heavens opened and the Spirit of God in the form of a dove descend upon Jesus and remain on him? I'm sure the answer to all of these questions is yes. He had been told, and he had seen, but was it truly the time God had spoken about for so many years? Had it finally arrived in Israel? It's interesting that Jesus' answer isn't a simple yes or even I am. Jesus' reply to John's question was to have his disciples go back and tell John what they were hearing and seeing. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those, with, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The, the dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. In other words, as John's disciples told John what they were hearing and seeing, John would likely have remembered the prophetic words spoken by Isaiah. He might have even remembered these words. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he did prepare the way of the Lord. The time, God's kairos time, God's perfect time, had indeed come. And then Jesus added, Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not, a, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, we might ask the question, well, why is this? Why? Would the least in the kingdom of heaven be greater than John? The answer would be because the least in the kingdom of heaven would have accepted the one to whom John was pointing. The least in the kingdom of heaven would have made the transition between the old covenant and the new. Next, Jesus said, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. With the coming of Jesus, the one to whom John pointed, the kingdom of heaven had been established in the earth realm. The advancing of the kingdom of heaven was taking place forcefully with each and every person who was delivered of demons or who was healed of all kinds of disease and sickness. The kingdom of heaven had been reigning in the earth since the fall of mankind into sin. But in Jesus, the kingdom of darkness was put on notice. Your days are coming to an end. A kingdom intensely greater than the kingdom of darkness is now in the earth. The people who realized what was happening in their midst flocked to Jesus. It didn't matter where Jesus was. People wanted to hear him teach because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers. Not only that, 
There was no sickness or disease or demon that stood a chance of continuing their torment in Jesus' presence. Even death had to release its victims. Who wouldn't want to take hold of what was now happening among them? The only ones we hear about are the religious leaders. Yes, there probably were others who didn't lay hold of the kingdom of heaven, but many people did lay hold of it. Some people were even willing to break Levitical ceremonial laws just so that they could get to Jesus. Then Jesus said, verse 13, For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Now when Jesus says that John is the Elijah who was to come, he is not advocating reincarnation. No, Jesus was saying this. He was saying the prophetic mantle which had been on Elijah, the spirit which had been on Elijah is the same prophetic mantle and the same spirit that had been, on, been given to John. So the prophetic mantle which had been on Elijah was now given to John to carry. Elisha, the servant of Elijah, had requested a double portion of the prophetic mantle Elijah wore, and he received it. John was born to carry the prophetic mantle of Elijah. He was born to prepare the way of the Lord. At the end of Malachi, we heard these words, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord come. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. This was John's message when he declared, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message of repentance is a message of turning, turning back to God and turning to the life God called his people to live. Then Jesus said, To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her actions. God's ways are so much different than our ways. Jesus and John did not fit into the preconceived ideas people had of how God would act among them. People stumbled over Jesus because of this. Even today, the preaching of a crucified and risen Lord is not so easy to accept. People think it foolish for God to become a man and then die for his creatures. The ones, the very ones who rebelled against him. The price God was willing to pay to reconcile mankind to himself boggles the mind, yet it truly is the only remedy that makes any kind of legitimate sense. God had to do what we could not do, and the wonderful thing about it was is that he was willing to do it. Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. It is rather amazing to think that a proclamation, the proclamation of a one-sentence sermon by Jonah, brought the Ninevites to repentance but that an abundance of miracles in the towns of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum didn't bring about their repentance at all. Had the people of these towns only sought out Jesus to have their immediate needs met? Weren't they giving any thought to the eternal? What does it take for people to get serious about their eternal destiny? Unfortunately, even today, people go about blissfully through their lives, giving little thought to eternity. 
Now, I am not advocating that we be so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. Again, let's think of this in terms of both and rather than either or. We cannot ignore this life or the next. Unfortunately, too many people wait for some sort of disaster to catapult them out of their complacency. Even then, however, when the disaster has passed and life gets back to normal, many people return to their old familiar ways. So much for permanent repentance or a permanent desire to have God in one's life. God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Unfortunately, too many people think God approves of their behavior because he is kind toward them. That's not the case at all. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and so we do not receive from him what we deserve. However, Let's not take for granted God's kindness and then live any old way we want to live. It isn't a very intelligent move on our part. In Galatians 6, we read, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Matthew Henry writes, some of the greatest scholars and the greatest statesmen have been the greatest strangers to gospel mysteries. St. Paul wrote, the world by wisdom knew not God. Those who are most expert in things sensible and secular are commonly least experienced in spiritual things. Men dive deep into the mysteries of nature, and yet they are ignorant of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. While the wise and prudent men of the world are in the dark about gospel mysteries, even the babes in Christ have the sanctifying, saving knowledge of them. Jesus has revealed them to babes. The Father has revealed them to babes, is what Jesus said. Such the disciples of Christ were. Babes in Christ. Not necessarily babes in age, but babes. Men, God, Christ's disciples, they were men of mean birth, lowly birth. They didn't have education. They weren't scholars or artists or politicians. They were unlearned and they were ignorant men. The difference between the wise and, and the babes is of God's own making. Had the wise honored God with the wisdom and the prudence they'd been given, he would have given them the knowledge of the better things. But because they served their own interests, they, he hid their hearts from this understanding. It is he that has revealed them to the babes, to those that you know, just aren't wise in the world's standards. Things revealed belong to our children. And to them, he gives an understanding to receive these things and the impressions of them. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Verse 27. Jesus said, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Son and the Father have perfect knowledge of each other, and no one can know the Father unless the Son chooses to reveal Him. It is not that God doesn't want to be known. He does want to be known. However, we can only know Him through His Son. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus' response to Philip was this, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Know the Son, and we will know the Father. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we had had any discouragement when Jesus said, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, our discouragement has vanished through the hearing of these words of invitation given to us by Jesus. The invitation is to all who are weary and burdened, 
Not some, but all. The invitation is to come to Jesus for rest. The invitation is for the weary and the burdened to learn from him. The image we have here is that of a team of oxen which are yoked together in order to accomplish a task. A team of oxen needed to be able to pull together, and so they were carefully matched by their owner. A perfectly matched team could accomplish much. I think that it's obvious to us to understand that Jesus can pull far more weight than any of us could ever, and yet he invites us to wear his yoke and learn from him. Though he is vastly more powerful than we are, he tells us that he is gentle and humble. He is not going to work us beyond what we can do. He is not going to race ahead of us and leave us in the dust. In fact, though Jesus is vastly superior to us in every way, he invites us to be yoked to him, and the burden then that we carry will be light and easy. And because it, is, it becomes light and easy to us, or it is light and easy to us, we are then able to rest, even as we work alongside Jesus. In Isaiah 40, we have these wonderful words of our God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope, those who wait on the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Even now, the Lord Jesus is extending his invitation out to everyone who is listening to these words. He invites the weary and the burdened. He invites us all to come to him. He invites us into his rest. He invites us to lean into his gentleness. He invites us to unburden ourselves. His arms are wide open. Wait no longer. Go to him. Shed the sin and guilt. He has already paid the price for that sin or those sins. And to each of you, he says, rest, 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 my beloved. Enter into my rest. Let me just bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible, his son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www. Dot livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.